Hi, uh, wish you all a very, very good day. Uh, I don't know whether it's morning, evening or night uh, when you're going to listen to this chapter. Uh, here we are uh, today uh, recording uh, the new session uh, that comes live or recorded rather from my master bedroom. Okay, so we continue where we had left off in the uh, first session. We left off the previous session on what we call as the advanced diagnostic aids. We had covered uh, different measures of uh, different techniques of probing and uh, different uh, probing and we learned about three different generations of probe. Today we will uh, discuss about the radiology and then we will see if we can finish off the lecture. Otherwise we will have one more part uh, of the same. Uh, the radiographic techniques are very, very important in periodontics because whatever decision we do clinically when we look at the pocket depth, we will also look at what we see is how it appears on a radiograph because at the end of the day, we have to understand that the periodontal tissues uh, include the alveolar bone. And this alveolar bone and the level of the alveolar bone would determine what we say as the prognosis of the tooth. For example, if there's a tooth which has got a pocket and will show a certain amount of mobility, then whether this tooth stays, whether it requires certain kind of an intervention, whether it would undergo a surgery, whether it would undergo a grafting, or whether it would undergo an extraction and then replacement with an implant, whatever is uh, the procedure that we do will involve radiography. And radiography forms a very, very integral part of entire uh, periodontal treatment apparatus. It forms a cornerstone of all our diagnostic abilities. And that's why radiographs are absolutely important and imperative to what we call as periodontal diagnosis and interventions. The various uh, radiographic, the conventional radiography is probably now obsolete. It's been obsolete for 10 years now. Uh, we are now looking at all in everything in radiography right now is all digital. So it includes conventional digital radiography, subtraction radiography, zero radiography again is obsolete. We do not do it anymore. Computer-assisted densitometric image analysis, it was good at one time, again, now it's obsolete. Uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging, also known as MRI, computer tomography. Uh, Intent history is primarily cone beam computer tomography. There is something called as nuclear medicine technique, or also known as bone scan, and then also something called as iodine-125 subphymetry. Please understand, any radiographic technique that we follow, any radiographic technique uh, that is done, okay, will tell us the past disease activity. Radiographs only tell us what happened till the moment that particular radiograph was shot. It tells us the past disease activity and does not, does not tell us what is happening right now or what is gonna to happen tomorrow. It only tells us what happened till the day you actually shot that radiograph or till that moment rather. So that's a problem. Now, second thing, with, there are the last two techniques that includes bone scanning as well as, well as iodine-125 subphymetry. These are the two techniques which will help us predict what is going to happen tomorrow. Apart from those two, everything else is just telling us what happened till you did the procedure. So understand, radiographs give us an indication of what happened and will not tell us what is going to happen. So we have to keep that in mind when we read radiographs for diagnosis. They are excellent tools. So let's see what are the various uh, tools in diagnosis in radiography. The radiographic tools, uh, the conventional radiography right now, as I said, is obsolete. Uh, we don't, even in colleges, we do not do any use conventional radiography, you know, it's all digital, okay? The, you have to understand a conventional radiography would involve a film with, which you shoot with a radiograph or with an X-ray beam which hits on it, then you process, then you read it. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. And always understand, when we read radiographs, we're reading not the, level, not the bone loss. Please understand, there's something called bone loss and there's something called a bone level. Radiographs only tell us bone level and that too in terms of how much white and how much gray it is. It only tells us gray zones. It doesn't tell us black, it doesn't tell us white. It only tells us the varying degrees of grays. And depending upon the varying degrees of grays, we will then assess what is the change that's happened in the tissue, okay? So radiographs are always gray and not different colors, okay? So it's very important for us to understand what is absolute gray and what is darker versions of gray, and that will help us in making us a diagnosis on the radiograph, okay? For all purposes, this is how would be a conventional radiograph would look, and then you can make out on that radiograph there on the screen, 
where the level of the bone is. So we describe the level of the bone in periodontal disease as in relation to the root length. So I would say the level of the bone, for example, on the first premolar with that red mark is at the junction of the middle and the apical third of the root in the distal aspect. Whereas on the second premolar, it is at the junction of the middle and the cervical one third of the root. Whereas on the first molar, you can see the part of the distal root that is exposed. The bone is at the level of the, probably at the mouth of the uh, distal root. So that's what you do. The radiographs and the bone levels on the radiographs are always measured and spoken in terms of relative position, relative position to the root of the tooth. And that's what would tell us what would be the diagnosis, what would be, how we would use this radiographic information as a prognostic tool or a diagnostic tool for all of our cases. Okay, so cur uh, currently uh, most of the radiographic tools what we use are all digital. Uh, there would be either a radiography that includes a sensor, which is a wire which connects to the computer. We all know about it. And then there is something called uh, phosphoplates or imaging systems, which are nothing like your films, but which are put into a processor. That's what we have now in our college. Okay. So now, uh, what are the various versions of this? Uh, there is something called a zero radiography. Okay. Uh, then there is something called a stereoscopy and then a scanner. All these procedures are obsolete. Uh, you don't need to know about them. Okay. So let's look at uh, subtraction radiography. Uh, subtraction radiography is nothing but no. For example, uh, one thing which is very important in periodontal disease is please understand uh, that periodontal disease and periodontal disease diagnosis is not a one step procedure. That is, the patient walks into the clinic and you don't make the, make the diagnosis on that particular day. You will write down the findings and then ideally you're supposed to see the patient between two different visits and then see how the disease is progressing and then make a diagnosis. So when I'm doing a diagnosis for a patient of mine and the way I'm looking at these cases, I'm looking at what we call as the bone levels. It will tell me, for example, if I have a patient today, I have made a radiograph, I see the same patient six months down the line or a year down the line, and then I make one more radiograph and then I will actually compare what's happened with the bone levels, whether the bone levels have remained stable, whether it's gone up or whether it's gone down. And that level of bone or the change in the bone levels will tell me how is the disease doing in this particular patient. So in order to understand uh, the change in the bone levels, subtraction radiography was um, uh, followed. Okay, what they did was it's nothing but you take two images at two different intervals and you superimpose them. And when you superimpose both of those images, then what you do is you see the change. The image uh, which shows a higher or a lower or apical or coronal movement of the bone and that would tell us what's happened to the particular bone level on this. So that's as simple as that, subtraction. You subtract the common areas and retain the uncommon areas. So if the uncommon area is higher, then you said there is bone gain. If the uncommon area is lesser, then you say there's a bone loss or there has been a reduction in the level of bone between these two visits. So that's what is nothing but subtraction radiography. Okay. Uh, the most important thing when you want to do a subtraction radiography, see to it that both the images are clicked exactly in the same manner. So that's why it's always important to follow a standardized radiographic procedure with the paneling cone technique so that the image or the, sense, uh, the sensor or the film is always kept exactly at the same point. Okay. Uh, the next thing about uh, uh, this one is something called as a much more easier version of subtraction radiography is what we call computer assisted densitometric image analysis. Now, uh, subtraction radiography was used primarily with conventional radiographs. When we have digital images, the procedure followed is what we call computer assisted densitometric image analysis because when you have a screen now on the when you have a screen or a computer screen, you can alter the darkness or the brightness of an image. Okay, and that's what will tell us the difference in the contrast. Now, what uh, the change in the contrast would do is it will tell us which area has changed and which area has not changed. So this principle of subtraction radiography, when it was applied onto measuring the change in the grayness on the computer screen, the term was known as computer assisted densitometric image analysis. So you measure the change. You evaluated the change in the density of the grayness between two serial radiographs. Okay, so what you did was again, you took two serial images, one today and probably one six months down the line or one six months previously. Then you projected both of them. As you project both those images, then if there is a change, for example, if these two, these are the two radiographs, which are superimposed like this, and then you see that there is bone gain. 
So this difference, uh, the common areas are deleted. And what this change, what you see here, is what is recorded. And that's what is known as computer-assisted and systematic image analysis. And because you're doing it on a screen, it is computer-assisted. There's nothing more than that in this procedure. Advantages, obviously, because it's on a screen and you can measure something, what we call the levels of grayness, uh, it's much easier than a conventional uh, subtraction radiography. Uh, please understand, all of these the procedures would require two serial images. Only then you can do this procedure. You cannot do it on one static image, what you've taken on that particular day. The next uh, and most commonly uh, performed procedure was uh, computer tomography. The next advanced procedure, computer tomography are also known as CAT scans, okay? Uh, in dentistry, CAT scans uh, were known as what we call as denta scans, okay? It was done on a conventional CT scan machine, what you see in various scan centers or in medical units. Okay, it's a huge machine and then what happens to so the patient is at the center and the tube goes around, then you get an image or the radiographic images. The problem with using a conventional uh, CT scan machine for dental was the radiation was too much and uh, there's a lot of scatter also that came along with that. So we did not like the computer images. So what we do now is what we call as a cone beam tomography. Cone beam tomography, it's very similar to what we have as our the machine looks exactly similar to a normal panoramic radiographic machine or OPG machine, okay? So the, the X-ray sources or the X-ray tube goes around, patient can be standing, the machine goes around and you get the image directly on the screen. The advantage of cone beam tomography as compared to conventional tomography was that the amount of radiation is far, far lesser. So what happened, you can shoot serial images at a much lesser degree of radiation to the patient and the cost also is far lesser to the patient and that's very very important okay so this is how uh, a conventional uh, radi digital radiograph uh, intraoral periapical you would uh, appear okay you can see the various degrees of grayness of uh, restoration would appear very opaqueish whitish whereas the bone would always look trabecular zones of black zones of light to gray zones of dark gray and you can see the bone levels on your uh, radiographs here Okay, and what you see here on the on the radiograph is you measure, for example, you have the canine there on the periapical radiograph uh, film. Uh, what do you see? The distal part of the tooth has what we call an angular kind of a bone loss. The bone level is at the on the canine is at the junction of probably the middle of the middle third, whereas on the first premolar it's at a much coronal level, probably at the junction of the cervical and middle third. So this kind of a defect, what you see is a angular kind of a bone defect. So that's what uh, made life much more easier because of digital and because of the going for digital, the amount of radiation that our patients were receiving was far lesser. On the other hand, the image what you see on the top corner on the right side of the screen, rather on the left side of the screen is a normal panoramic image. It's like what you call as the OPG or a panoramic radiograph. Earlier it used to be conventional, now it's all digital. The same dental cone beam CT image is used to do a panoramic radiograph and that's why it makes that much more easier. Okay, and the sections what you see underneath here are all cone beam images. So what's the biggest advantage of cone beam image? You can see the tooth and the tissues from all different directions. So you can see here uh, the section, the figure A is an occlusal view. You can see from top down. The figure uh, C is a panoramic view similar to what you have OPG. Figure D is what we call a cross section. So you can see, it's like, for example, you take a tomato or, or I mean onion and section it and then see the section piece. You can just take that section piece and see. You can see exactly what's happening on that piece. Exactly that's what is a cross section image. And then what you see on B is what we call as reconstructed images. When A, C, and D are combined, and then you can reconstruct a 3D image or a 3D reconstruction. And that's what tells us the external morphology and that's the biggest advantage of using a cone beam image or a CT scan and that's why in current parlance, in current parlance, dental parlance, current perioparlance, I would not see any patient in my practice without a cone beam image. A cone beam image is absolutely important for making most of the diagnosis and treatment plannings. Uh, the next technique that came was MRI or a magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging in the medical field is primarily used for assessment of soft tissue tumors, which are encased within a heart tissue. So for example, brain. You want to analyze brain 
that's very easy. Uh, MRI is the way to go and not a CT scan. CT scan, CT scan will primarily tell you the radiographic change on the heart tissue, whereas MRI will tell you the soft tissue change. Okay, in dentistry per se, MRI is not much of use, uh, pretty expensive. The advantage is there's no radiation here, just the magnetic waves, they hit back and then go back and fall on the sensor. The advantage is you can figure out when the finest nerves, everything. But uh, unless you're actually doing a neural reconstruction of infrared, al alveolar nerve, etc., uh, you don't need a uh, MRI image. MRI is per se very good. Otherwise, if you want to assess the TM joint, the capsules, etc., in perio, uh, MRI would probably uh, be of uh, very less uh, usage. Okay. Uh, the issue with all these techniques, as I was telling you till now, uh, was that they're all static images. The static means they work and they'll tell you exactly what happened till that particular day, till you shot that image. What happens even a minute after that is not anyone's guess. So that's why the need was always felt that can we do something by which I can anticipate what's going to happen to this patient tomorrow? How will this patient show me tomorrow? And that's when, uh, the orthopedic circles were looking at, especially when they were studying these uh, osteoporotic individuals, postmenopausal women, they started finding that they want to have a tool which will help us identify the changes before they actually happen. They want to look at the molecular changes happening in the bone even before the actual change happens. And that's where the nuclear medicine came into picture. What this nuclear medicine does is nothing. It's very, very simple. What you do is you take a radiographic or what we call a radionucleoide. And that radionucleoide is usually a technetium-99 per technate or iodine-123 or iodine-131 or a thallium or gallium, any of these radionucleoides. So what is done is technetium-99 per technate is usually injected IV into the patient. And as this uh, dye is injected into the patient, the patient, uh, the dye flows into the body, and then after that, you're subjected to a CT scan machine or your a radionuclide reader. For example, uh, I don't know if you, uh, how many of you watched uh, this movie? Uh, what's that actually? Mission Impossible Fallout. You know, uh, in the end, on the last scene, when Tom Cruise and all they go, they're testing for where is the radionuclide, isn't it? In the tent, what they've shown as Leela Ladakh or the Nubra Valley, where they shot it. Uh, they're testing for what you call a radionuclide. They're testing for radiation. Exactly the same radiation testing handheld machine is run through the patient's body. And then where the areas of redness or whatever you see on the radionuclide redness, that will tell you exactly these are the areas where there is hyperactivity. It tells that these are the areas where there is inflammation happening. If you, some of you, if you follow cricket uh, or football or anything, you will see that uh, most of these uh, players, when they have an injury, the first thing they do is they are subjected to bone scan because they want to know what's happening in which part of the bone even before the actual changes actually happen. So these areas which appear red, they are the areas which is hyperactivity is going on. And these are the changes or these are the areas where a bone loss or change in the bone level is going to happen tomorrow. So I'm trying to predict, I'm trying to predict tomorrow where the bone will be today itself. And that's the biggest advantage of using these nuclear uh, medicine uh, or nuclear scans. So for example, if I have a patient who gives me a family history of uh, aggressive forms of periodontis, for example, someone comes to the clinic and says, my parents lost their teeth at probably the age of 24, 25, or probably 30, 35, and doctor, I'm scared I have that I may lose my teeth. So then what I do, I do all the clinical evaluation, then I'll subject this patient to a radionuclide scan and then say, okay, let's look at how the bone scan tells us and how the bone is. Now, depending upon how good the bone or, or bad the bone is, uh, or the scan is, I can exactly tell you, see, you're good, you're bad, or uh, you are at the change of, you are at a level where you are going to break down a lot of bone. So we, let's start putting you on interventions so that we can protect the bone levels around your teeth. And that's the biggest advantage of these radionuclide uh, scanning procedures. I hope you're understanding uh, what I'm telling. So a radionuclide scan will actually help us predict what's going to happen. The same thing is with iodine-125 absorptiometry. It's exactly the same thing. Instead of a technician 99 per technique, you use iodine-125. 
and that dye is taken up by osteocytes and osteoclasts. So as the osteoclasts rather, not osteocytes, and as this is taken up by osteoclasts, the concentration of iodine 120, uh, 125 in particular certain areas will tell us exactly where higher osteoclastic activity is happening and the areas where there is higher osteoclastic activity, those are the areas where we are going to find bone loss tomorrow and not today. Today, there are osteoclasts. They have not yet removed the bone. So if I sense that, then I can intervene. We can intervene in those areas and then take care of the problem. Okay. So that uh, uh, concludes our assessment on bone. Let's look at, uh, let's stop this now. Uh, I'll just upload this and then again, I will take the next part on microbiological uh, sections.